Puzzle games are games that have always fascinated me, but I never delved into them too much because of having to use my first person shooter brain to actually, you know, solve stuff outside of games such as the Portal series, Superhot, and The Witness, which I've all found interesting simply because of that first person perspective. These sorts of games have you solving all kinds of puzzles, one involving portals, one having to determine your every move while the game moves alongside you, and the other just taking you to an island where a plethora of puzzles await you and you just solve them. Nothing could have prepared me for the game I'd be playing next, and that's Super Liminal, developed by Pillow Castle. This is like other games of its genre except it's about perspective, depth, and the idea of dreams. Where do we truly go when we dream? How do we experience it? Can we write our own worlds when we dream? Superliminal explores all these questions with its levels and today I'm going to analyze and go through my first playthrough experience, talking about the different puzzles and how it helped me to question my perspective on life. If you enjoy the video, like and subscribe and notifications turned on for more gaming content. Let's get dreaming, shall we? Superliminal starts with a television ad from a company known as Somnoscope, who offers dream therapy to those who are struggling with dilemmas or just small things in life that they don't want to be in the real world anymore, so to speak. This therapy would take place at the Pierce Institute and patients are put to sleep upon starting and are slotted time to show up in their own constructed dream world. The scene also takes place at 3am, which is very important to note because time will become one of the main themes of this game. Parking lot at the University Medical Center. Somnuscult will make your dreams come true. Right after the ad ends, the player presumably falls asleep and wakes up in one of these dream worlds, ready to begin their therapy. I just had a thought as a writer in this, which I may come back to later, because my thought process was that this guy just fell asleep in his room, but maybe he actually signed up for the dream therapy and was already ready to go from the get-go. But as you proceed, you fail to wake up multiple times. Unless it's just a result of the player dreaming multiple times since the average human dreams 3-5 to five times a night. Just a thought, but it may be of importance later as we continue playing. I get it working in some sort of blocked off room and I sign a terms of service that I can't seem to read, but I mean, who reads terms and conditions and privacy policies anyway? You enter the following room and the game introduces you to its unique mechanic, which is resizing. They give you some pawn pieces with an important note. Perception is reality. These are three recurring words that never slip away from the player throughout the entire game and get elaborated on with later levels thanks to the different kinds of puzzles you'll be doing. Seeing these pawn pieces with a pickup icon made me want to pick it up, so naturally, I picked the piece up, put it all the way towards the sky and dropped it. Objects can be made to be either bigger or smaller and helps to emphasize perspectives. When you view an object from say 100 or 200 meters away, like a traffic sign or a glass, since our eyes have depth perception, the further something is away from us, the smaller the object is at first glance. The closer we get to an object, the bigger it looks. And by the time you're incredibly close to it, it'll be to its intended size. Superliminal stresses perspective out by having to distance your objects as far as you can, while also taking note of how high you drop it when you try to resize it. Objects can also be sized to be smaller by simply bringing it to a wall or any surface. The first level has you getting familiar with these mechanics, resizing cubes to create a platform that allows you to jump into the next area and resizing objects to fit into smaller buttons and crevices. Take this pawn piece for example in one of the rooms. I try to make it bigger to pass it over to the other wall but the size of it is too big and the metal is blocking the way, so to make it fit on one of the sides of the button, I simply press it against the wall and it becomes small enough to be able to fit inside and open the door to the next room. Right after this one, this time instead of cubes and chess pieces, you're using pieces of cake and I just kept dropping it down until it was able to build a ramp high enough to reach the door. Also forgot to mention that you can rotate objects as well. I should also take an opportunity to briefly introduce the standard orientation protocol or the chick voice that speaks to you in different sections throughout the game, who in a sense is sort of reminiscent of GLaDOS from Portal 2 but she's not as antagonizing. She's more or less just there to inform you every now and then that you fucked up in some way and you need to fix it. Continuing along, there's a broken opening on the left side of this room, seemingly a lost or incomplete area of the established dream world which 
if you take the planks out and head out there, the protocol will say this. Warning, you have deviated from the orientation pathway. At the Pierce Institute, patient safety is a keynote in our corporate priority tetrahedron. A variable degree of force can and will be authorized to ensure patient safety. Please return to the orientation pathway. Alluding to the fact that the therapy should be taken seriously as consequences will be laid out if you deviate from the path. There's a mechanic in Superliminal where you can't carry objects from one room to another. Seemingly which I'd assume is put there for the sake of balance because you don't want players having to use the same objects over and over and you have to bring this cube from one side to another. The next puzzle is more or less the same but two buttons need to be pressed at the same time so I grab this stop and go sign and enlarge it to be almost as big as the room to press them down and progress. The last part had me struggling for a while as outside of this cake piece I found outside of the room, I had no idea how to progress. I probably spent about 20 minutes in here before realizing that I had to push the piece towards the broken walls, effectively opening up a path for me to proceed. After that, it's just a simple walk to the exit and... You awake back in your room with the alarm going off that reads 3am. You're officially in your dream state. I walk back towards the back of the reception bar and off I go. The start of this level really intrigued me as you walked down these red and white hallways with everything looking the same, from the white doors to the symmetrical lamps and the occasional paintings. It reminded me of luxurious hotels where you have these exact same sort of hallways with a bunch of doors being on the left and right. I think there's something to take from all of these rooms, being either gateways to other dream worlds or maybe they're rooms of other patient dream worlds but because it's theirs and not yours, you have no entry to go into any of them. To further emphasize this, some doors have a sign that says some doors are best left closed. I guess I shouldn't peek into their fantasy. I had to walk around a bit more just to take it all in. The area trips you out a few times with this door looking like a way to go but it's just extruded and another hallway that gets smaller the further you walk into it and makes you feel like a giant. Speaking of giants, I made one of the exit signs huge enough to create a ramp going out, then stumbled across this whiteboard with a bunch of drawings showing the architecture and layout of the dream world. I presume that the other world slash states are probably the same as well. Looking behind and heading forward, I see a cassette player flashing red and as soon as I interact with her, you get introduced to the main character of the game. Dr. Glenn Dr. Pierce, Glenn. creator of Somnuscop. About being special. So special, in fact, that we have no idea where you are. But not to worry, we're working on it. He acts as the main voice and narrator for Superliminal as you'll find more of these cassette players later on and he gives you short talks, pieces of advice and assures you that you're on the right path. His first few words talk about you being special and having no idea where you are, which makes complete sense. You fall asleep to an ad, you wake up in some random, surreal world and have no idea on what you're doing other than finding ways to go forward. I make this cube by matching the pictures, use the cube to climb over and here comes the next puzzle I get stuck in for ages. I actually cheesed it by using the first cube you made to jump over to the right side painting, then resize the cube to be big enough to where I can jump and move on to the next puzzle. But then you just get stuck. Thankfully, restarting the checkpoint spawns the cube that you're meant to be using which is a cube made of platforms inside. I really wanted to know how the cube was created so I went back and tried solving it again to no avail and after looking up the solution, it was right there before my eyes the whole time. You have to first create this table which you do by lining the bits up together, then you match the pictures like you did with the first one and voila, you have your cube. It's crazy to me that some of these puzzles are so simple at first, yet I couldn't solve them for ages. Using the cue from before, you match the side of the door with the one below, the door opens and you move on to the next area, which is more or less the same thing, opening a hole outside the warehouse. Superliminal also has secrets and cool things to discover as I found my first one by using both the cube and the king chess piece, and I found a cool red cube alongside an achievement which doesn't serve any use other than looking really cool. Spoiler alert, this is the only one I ever find. 
Dr. Glenn Pierce speaks to me again, this time informing me that we now have access to a series of elevators to help trigger our subconscious to help us wake up. Conscious to gradually wake you up. You should also find a variety of emergency exit signs that should lead you to them. Will all of this work? Absolutely. This next section had me troubled for a while as I tried interacting with everything possible in this room but to no avail. Once again. But then I looked up in the mirrors and saw that the moon was the only object I hadn't interacted with. And what do you know, it's the object I needed. An audio recording plays from Dr. Pierce once again informing us that if we don't wake up, he wants us to remain calm and try not to touch anything. Going into the elevator, I notice that there aren't any visual indicators, like a light flickering on the buttons to indicate what floor we're going to, or the vibration of the elevator to indicate whether it's going up or down, making me question whether or not the elevator is going up or down. I think the elevator is going up in this instance because if Pierce said that it's gradually trying to wake us up, you wouldn't be going deeper into a dream, you'd be going up, trying to get out of it or go into a headspace where it's safer and less likely to damage you. Since dreams can last upwards of a few seconds to a few minutes, you wouldn't want to stay in a dream longer than you should since it can cause brain damage or some sort of issue, hence Dr. Pierce's reassurance of remaining calm if you struggle to get out, like say, sleep paralysis for instance. Can I just say, these loading screens are so cool. There's so many of them that I couldn't keep count but some can be trippy and weird which adds to the surrealism of the game. You wake up once again, this time it's now 4am. The layout of this area is always the same as well. This time I grabbed myself a red soda, threw it in the bin and got an achievement, so that was nice. A yellow sign shows a cube, indicating that these are going to be the main objects to use this level. Oh, and not to mention, the name of this level is called Cubism as well. I saw this calendar in the room and took a moment to look at it, like you would with any of these sorts of pictures if you see them around social media and just watch the lines move around. Fascinating stuff, really. Perception is reality. Your friendly doctor. P.S. We'll get through this wink face. Whatever that means. Pop goes the first cube and up we go. More platforming here with two cubes. Go down some cool hall I opened and what do you know? There's more cubes. Great. Yeah, this level isn't too interesting outside of these makeshift platforms that come out and the one cube that breaks into a thousand pieces. At least the red cubes make a return again for a few seconds. Now this level is where it gets interesting. Dr. Pierce graces us with his presence and talks about tough topics, that being worthlessness and self-doubt. The idea of this level is that it's meant to be a nightmare of sorts, entering a part of the dream where you suddenly gain these sorts of depressing feelings. Why do I feel like everything is going wrong, even when the sun is shining? The timing of him ending the following sentence and the lights going out was just perfect. The emergency lights turn on and something sinister is going on in the dream world. Lights flicker and the world is shifting as you go from one place to another. Blood is seen on the floor with a handprint sitting right next to the door that shuts as you go up towards it. Could there be a supernatural presence around? This is the moment where I started to get a little nervous as I don't recall seeing horror as a tag for this game. Going forward, things get scarier with murder being written on a chalkboard, the word die being repeatedly shown to you even though it's just diet soda boxes as you come right out of it, and more blood is shown, creating a sense of suspense and fright within the player and hoping they don't get killed too. I stumble across this big hole and notice some planks on the floor which I have to use to cross. At first, I didn't notice the planks so I just jumped into the hole thinking it teleported me across but it just brought me back to the beginning so I eventually looked to the sides to find the planks. Crossing over, Dr. Pierce tells us that we're having these feelings because we want to be happy like everyone else in our life, and to his point, I agree. The feelings of worthlessness and self-doubt I mentioned before. You feel this way because you want the kind of happy life you see all around you. The kind you know everyone else is enjoying. And that's exactly why we're here to help. When we feel down, we look up to others as a way of coping and being happy again whether that's family, friends, online, or even content creators. 
I approached this red area and came to a dead end with protocol informing me that I failed my task as I'm not even supposed to be here. ...dreams but have now descended into a dream within a dream instead, disorienting yourself even further. You are responsible for failing to make this crucial distinction. I tried to use this red sign similar to how I used a piece of cake to break these planks but it wasn't working. Later on, I noticed that the sign can be used as a flashlight so... I decided to backtrack and light the dark areas and whoa, there's a path here that I definitely would not have seen at all because of how freaking dark it is. Originally, the developers were making a flashlight for this level, but because of how the mechanic worked, it only lit up one area, so they opted to use an object that can glow from both ends. This is by far one of the coolest sections in the game for me. Using the sign once again to light up this next area, I proceed through the door and continue walking down this hallway with all this blood on the floor. I think something bad's gonna happen here. I see something across that looks like IKEA but it just says IDEA and upon interacting with it, it powers up the entire room and the blood on the floor? It was just red paint. Blackout is a level that uses the idea of horror well to create a suspense and scary level that reflects something of a nightmare and uses clever lighting and mechanics to make the player feel uncomfortable the whole way through. I thought it was gonna get worse later on but it defaulted back to reality after. There's a board next to the elevator showing pictures of avocados. Cloning? Which is the real one? And an avocado ad in the elevator. This leads into the next level, cloning, which is all about creating copies of objects to give yourself a path forward. Before you start, you can pick one of eight songs and it doesn't change anything with the game, just gives you a different song to bop over. The first one has you clone the green doors which creates a platform that allows you to ascend up and go over the wall. Protocol comes in again and tells me about dream overexposure, one being significant memory loss which, I mean, it makes sense seeing that you forget the majority of your dreams when you wake up anyway. Everything else is all open for interpretation, particularly when she says side effects since even as of today, scientists are still trying to figure out how dreams work. This next puzzle has you clone alarm clocks but with a twist. For every alarm clock you pick up, it creates another one, so you have to do a bit of thinking to try and use as little as possible so you can create a viable path. Or you can just full send and keep spamming until something sticks. It can work, it just takes a bit longer. If it becomes too much, you can right click to return all the objects and start again. There's a smiley face that gets put on your crosshair right after you finish this puzzle and I always keep thinking that there's something important with this face but it's just something that the developers put in to play with your mind. The next puzzle involved me taking the green apple away from the bottom and that was easy as cloning and using said clones to push them towards the big apple and take them out. Now, this one had me struggling for a long time. You see, you have to get an apple from one side to the other to, to go towards its bottom but there's a fan in the way so the moment the apple touches it, it's kaput and off the map. I tried the full send approach as mentioned earlier. I tried pushing the objects towards the stairs using my character and got so close but it fell off and tried making my own vertical platform starting from atop the apple and going forward but again, I fell off. As a desperate final attempt, I cloned the fire alarm switches but it was just taking too damn long so I looked it up and again, the answer felt so obvious. All you had to do was line your crosshair up with both the apple and the platform that it's meant to sit on and clone it. That's it. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Frustrations aside, I press forward and Protocol pulled up to talk to me like she's in some kind of freaking simulation or something. Then Dr. Pierce says a few sentences incorrectly, taking them completely out of context. Hello, name is my Pierce Dr. Glenn. To the Somnusculpt welcome experience, team of your care leader patient years 10 development. Conditions struggle you whatever with? Professional invention. Edge science with cutting, a tomorrow can bright. And buts, no ifs, or look good. I'm not really sure what this can mean other than the dream world malfunctioning in a way that the protocol is trying to do some sort of manipulation or hack. Ah, we look at that. More red apples. My current worst nightmare in Superliminal. Instead of heading towards the reception like you've done the past few levels, the game instead takes you to a relaxation room where you'll be greeted with a projector screen showing blue skies and white clouds, along with these words being muttered.
There's also an accompanied chair with a drink and a footrest. I think this is, as the name of the room implies, relaxing, but sort of like a decompressor, given what just happened prior with Dr. Pierce feeling out of place and his words making no sense. The player is at a point now where they must have gotten out of the dream and woke up for a time, then slowly seep themselves back into it without even realizing, as Pierce acknowledges that you've been picked up on the systems again and to continue with whatever it is that you're doing. Then the whole walk to the reception process, grab a drink and go thing comes back and you're back into it. This level's puzzles are all about scale and you'll be resizing objects and houses to make yourself fit. The coolest part about this level is you'll be able to see your character adjust their movement speed according to how big an object is when you walk into it. The first house you resize has you adjust multiple times to make sure your character can climb over whatever it is they need to climb. Make it too big and you won't be able to climb the wall, but make it small enough and you'll be able to climb it no problem. Notice that in the next section, the door is too small and unable to fit your big body. It's the same house, but a different part of it, if you will, and you have to readjust for you to fit in it, so that's what I did. Dr. Pierce reaffirms to continue what you're doing, while also telling the player to disregard any experiences they had, albeit moments that made them feel uncomfortable or maybe nightmarish, and yay, will you look at that, Jenga blocks and a door waiting for us to enter. I grab this big fan, make it as big as possible, and send those blocks flying, alongside dropping the path for me to follow. I did get stuck here for a while because I wasn't sure if I had to use the fan for something, but then noticed that one of the windows was interactable, so I picked it up and scaled that bitch to make me fit in. This next area is actually where I got my thumbnail from, and looking up above will portray different perspectives of facing forward, which seems surreal from the first time you do it. If I was to take a picture of that in the actual path, they wouldn't know which one it is. But I don't think that's the point of the area. I think the point of this is to just highlight different perspectives and I guess the developers showing off since Pierce's words here are more about something else than the actual section shown here. He talks about negativity and not to focus on it, but instead focus on the positives of life, the things that make you happy. These, the cruelty of time, the cold shell of human nature, or the eventual loss of everything you've ever held dear. Whatever you do, don't focus on that. Now we have a jumping castle all of a sudden, but with another door inside. Madness. Literally madness. I made this scene bigger than my mate, and my movement speed is hindered significantly because of how big the jumping castle is. I headed over to the vent and learned that you have to put the jumping castle over to the other side as the entrance you came in from was also the exit, so I made it so small that upon exiting, I became a snail. After what felt like a walking sim, I went into the next area and it was more or less the same thing, except there were two doors which, when you went into one, it would take you to another. Something like something out of portal. The goal of this puzzle is to fit yourself through the keyhole. At first, I thought of making it big enough for me to just simply go in, but the keyhole was too small. Then I went the extra mile and thought there was technically four doors as a result of having two different dimensions slash realities because of the doors looking different every time I entered. So I tried making these other doors or whatever so big that when I came out of it, it would make me small. And while it did work, the keyhole was just too big or small for me to fit. Then an idea came to me after like 20 minutes. What if I made one of the doors small enough to fit into the keyhole, like I sort of did with the jumping castle, since you go from one to the other? And it worked. I'm quite sad I lost 20 minutes of time that I'm never getting back. I walk on in and you become a snail once again, seeing a house across from me that can be picked up to make me fit and another elevator approaches. Onwards and upwards. Oh, cute cat. New character. Well, he's short lived anyway. His name is Emergency Exit Protocol and tries to get you out of the dream mode as it's causing issues with your brain. Too bad this gets interrupted by protocol and gets recorded as an error, suggesting that you are not out of the woods yet and are still dreaming, but showing other emotions which is stressing both the system out and you. You are exhibiting signs consistent with an increase in fear, hopelessness and frustration. This is inconceivable as Somnasculpt therapy is proven to correlate with a decrease in these emotions. She factory resets you and you're back in your room. Going out to the reception, go get your dream soda, and you're back to the room again. Turn the alarm off, exit out, go to the reception, and you're back to the room again. Something's not right here. Again. 
turn the alarm off, and wake up once again to find the world flipped upside down. The dream world is falling apart. I drop down the door leading to an exterior area with a bunch of tables that I assume to be some sort of work break area, and once again, another alarm is going off. How many alarms do you want me to turn off? Anyway, turn the alarm off, and we're back into the room once again. I don't know how many times they want to put me back in this freaking room. <sighs> okay, I've walked out. I think we're good now, and the reception is blocked off. Great. As you can tell from the name of the level, Labyrinth is all about mind fucks, to put it lightly. Flipping the world as you know it and seeing all kinds of perspectives and trippiness. Upon exiting through a painting and walking myself out, Dr. Pierce congratulates me on completing the orientation protocol, and only now does he talk about the real therapy starting. Before you begin the first phase of therapy, I'd like to briefly describe the finite and fragile nature of the dream state. The maps are all over the place, doors are in weird spots, and everything's just become a clusterfuck, and I think it's primarily due to the player's current dream state, which doesn't seem to be natural judging from everything being shifted around. I love how this part in particular has you try to create this yellow cube like you've been doing in the past, but it ultimately just leads you going deeper, which brings up the point I made earlier. Remember when I said that the elevators are going up to try and get us out of the dream? Now it seems like we're going deeper and deeper as objects and things we try to do keeps pushing us lower in. The therapy is trying to keep the player in the dream space for good. One of my favorite puzzles in the game begins as I went through it like normal, not thinking about the gimmick whatsoever. But the more I did it and heard the good ding and the bad ding go off, the more I realized that there was definitely more than just running down a bunch of holes and the answer was to look opposite of where the arrow is facing as you walk yourself across, since whichever direction you look at when you exit the hole is going to be where the red wall gets placed. I did this five times, walked through a door, used a cube to get myself up two times, tried putting a queen piece on top of the button that ended up just being a fabrication of reality. Thankfully, there was a knight piece waiting for me on the other side. Dr. Pierce politely tells you that if you exhaust too many dreams at a given time, you'll be put into a coma. This whole sequence feels like a wild goose chase thanks to the amazing OST playing in the background. It tries to get you pumped and in the thrill of the moment because although you don't know what's going on, you have to keep pushing forward to try and get yourself out of this rabbit hole. It's completely different from all the pianos and relaxation beats you've heard the entire game. Turn the alarm off for the 70th time and now I'm in an infinite elevator loop which if you pay close attention there's arrows that you follow to get yourself out. I press an alarm again, enter an elevator, and we teleport to the university parking lot. I head forward and all of a sudden, the entire parking lot comes towards me. Then I realize it's just a picture and so are all the other sides when I walk towards it. Thankfully, after walking to the last side and entering what appears to be my room, I turn the alarm off once more, and it's finally done. Okay, so the start of this next part involves this house that you pick up from a table, and I had no idea what to do. I tried making one smaller while I made the other bigger. I tried putting myself on the table to see if I could enter one of the other buildings, but I wasn't getting anywhere. Turns out you have to overload your dream. So you make the one on the table big enough for you to go through, make the other one smaller and bring it alongside you while you go through the door, which causes this dream explosion and turns everything to white. The game from here on out becomes a walkie simulator and an experience, taking the time to sink everything in with exposition coming out from Dr. Pierce about the creation of this dream world. His dream was something of white space where everything is, you guessed it, white and was exactly what he perceived. I noted the random objects and doors that you see as you go forward, such as erase me, relaxiat, that's not a word, minerals and female tones. Female Toad struck me the most because when we dream, we don't think about what we dream. Whatever it comes into our brains goes and you can dream about all kinds of things, even female toads, which is something completely random, but hey, that's how the brain works. 
Now, before you go out and say it, yes, I do know that lucid dreams exist where you can gain total control of your dreams. And it's common among us for it to happen at least once a month. But I don't think Pillow Castle was trying to illustrate that. Shortly after, I dropped down into an area of file cabinets and papers. Lots of papers. These papers I presume to be dreams from yourself since this is your dream state, your world. I wouldn't be surprised if this was all compiled over a few years. However, all these pieces of paper read the same thing. Perception is reality. I like to think of these words as what you see is what you usually get. When I set an alarm for 7 or 8 in the morning, I know that I'm going to wake up at that time to get ready for work and be there by 9 o'clock to start my shift. When I write a script like I'm doing right now, I know that I'm going to be recording myself saying my own words that I put on a piece of paper. When I order food online, I know that's going to be what I eat for dinner or lunch or even breakfast. This is how I perceive this terminology, but it can also mean other things too, like thinking of different situations or realities for whatever it is you're thinking about or imagining set scenarios. The rest of this level is showing more black and white and Dr. Pierce comes to a realization that it's much harder to dream in this sort of world than it is to dream somewhere else. Carried, I realized that seeing things the way I wanted to was not as easy as it used to be. Upon flicking the light switch, the game goes dark and I thought the game finished but it wasn't over. Continuing to walk through this amazing level in illustration, it's more black and white and hearing Dr. Pierce continue his study, if you will, about the dream state. But we hope that you won't get discouraged. After all, if this is a place of pure perspective, isn't it also a place where a different point of view could make anything possible? Isn't that why you came here? Cool chess piece puzzle coming up. Put chess pieces down on set platforms, lets you walk over it, rinse, repeat, until the end. Then I jump down a bunch of black and white blocks to walk through this amazing place that reminds me of those walking rooms and theme parks where you walk down an area and just see all the cool stuff. Or like a mirror or an illusion room. That's probably simple enough. To close it off, you lift the black cube, drop into the abyss, and here comes 8am. The time when you should be waking up. The final level of the game brings you back to all the levels you've been to throughout the game and Dr. Pierce gives his final monologue before he closes the books on your dream therapy. I kind of want to summarize it because I think just hearing the scene and watching it unfold feels so much more impactful than me talking over it because of how inspiring he is when he says all the things he says to you here. You faced challenges and you conquered them. You saw life from a different lens and now you're ready to take on anything that comes your way. Even though everything you did here wasn't real, you can still take what you learned and use it for the journey ahead. The power of perspective. And so we do the same things again and again and again. And therein, of course, we find exactly the failure we were looking for. be a struggle and you will always have problems but today you have the chance to see things differently even though it meant facing obstacles that seemed impossible at first you thought outside the box and you overcame them because you saw things from every angle you understood them for what they really were 
because you kept moving forward, no matter how far off the path you were told you were headed, or how unexpected it became, you found your way. of you will say that none of this was real. So how could it have really meant anything? But just like the power of perspective itself, it will have been as real as you believed it to be. All you've got to do is wait. Up. It's a very touching moment and I can see how all the events led up to that moment. By completing everything that was set out in front of you, even with obstacles being thrown your way, you were able to come out on top and become a better person. Come to think of it, this experience was sort of like a lucid dream. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. This is my first sort of essay piece and I wanted it to be on Superliminal because given its short length and message, this game has not only made me realize how we perceive reality, but also the challenges of life we face every day. You know. We have days where we just don't want to deal with any of that and so dreaming to an extent on top of real life things we do to escape reality like playing video games sort of helps with that. People have reviewed this game as a life changing experience and I can agree with them. Even though I'd make the argument that the puzzles in this game can be a bit dull and not like other games of its genre, it's the message and experience that counts and I hope that even if you've played or haven't played, you learned the power of perspective and how we think and feel every day is very important to ourselves, our families, and our friends. Make the right decisions. Be better people. Think before you do. Oh, and if I missed anything or just want to talk about my own analysis, I'm happy to talk about it in the comments. I'll have more coming to you soon. Peace.